Kelsey. This is my channel, The Fancy Hat Lady Reads. I'm wearing one of my fancy booktube hats, and today I am finally bringing you my December wrap-up, so my last wrap-up for 2017. Um, I read some things in December. It was a bit of a spotty reading month for me. I was reading a lot of shorter things um, because of the holidays and travel for the holidays and getting ready to travel for the holidays and all of the sort of family stuff that goes with the holidays. But I still have seven things to talk to you about today, even though not very many of them were like full-length adult novels. So the first thing I read in December was this. This is a kid's graphic novel. Of course, it is Hilda and the Midnight Giant by Luke Pearson. This is the second book in the Hilda series, the first of which was Hilda and the Troll, um, originally published, I think, as Hilda Folk. Anyhow, I think these are totally charming. This was just as charming as the first. I think this one even had a little more of a concrete story to it than the first book, which sort of got by on just, you know, ex its eccentricity and charm. It's all about this little girl named Hilda who lives with her mother in a house in this magical valley. Um, what happens in this book is that uh, Hilda and her mother discover that they are being evicted from their home by these invisible elves. And so Hilda has to navigate their incredibly, you know, hilariously complicated bureaucracy to try to figure out how to not get evicted. She has to sign this paperwork so she can see that, oh yes, her house is in the middle of this elf city, and she and her mom have been, like, trampling on them for years without even knowing they were there. Meanwhile, there is this midnight giant who keeps showing up and hanging around, and uh, Hilda wants to find out where he comes from and what he's doing there. And it all ties together in the end in a wonderfully poignant way. I do love how sort of eccentric the random bits of world building you get in this series are, like this one page where her mom is watching out the window and she's like, oh, the wafts are migrating, isn't it beautiful? And the wafts are like these big furry things, like globular animals with tails in the sky, and they're cute and hilarious. Anyhow, I will definitely be continuing on with this series. This is a series I'm getting from the library. Um, I'm really enjoying them. The next thing I read was a NetGalley arc on my Kindle, and this was The Girl in the Tower by Catherine Arden. This is the sequel to The Bear in the Nightingale, the second book in what is going to be the Winter Night Trilogy. And I have already done a full review of this in a uh, triple review video where I talked about three fantasy books inspired by Russian history. I will link that video for you so you can go check it out. I thought this one, overall I liked it a lot. It was more of a fast-paced fantasy adventure novel than the first one, which felt a little more atmospheric and slow and, quote, literary. This one definitely feels a bit more like, okay, this is a fantasy series. For me, it's sort of like six of one, half a dozen of the other. Um, I liked both the first book and the second one a lot. I gave them both four stars, so this one was four stars for me. Next, I read another kid's graphic novel um, that I have already returned to the library, and this is Night Lights by Lorena Alvarez. Um, this one, I feel like it's got a lot of hype behind it. I keep seeing it, like, featured in bookstores and stuff. But I liked it. The art was beautiful, but it just felt way more skeletal than I was hoping for in terms of actual story. I wish I still had the book with me because I'm not remembering the details as clearly as I uh, probably should in order to really talk about it. It's about this little girl named Sandy and she likes to draw and she's like acting out in school and it's not going so great. And she meets another girl in school who like may or may not be real, who uh, initially praises her art but then gets like weird and creepy about it and it does get like dark and weird and creepy. Anyways, it touches on a lot of like big themes without really doing any more than just touching on them. There's this idea of why we make art and do we do it for ourselves or do we do it for someone else? And the art was really interesting not just because these, uh, you know, things that Sandy draws that kind of come to life are just gorgeous, gorgeous and colorful, but because it's a stark contrast with how um, her everyday life, like her Catholic school that she attends, 
um, and her home life are drawn in these really gray, you know, monotone, dull colors. But it just didn't give me quite enough, and the ending didn't give me enough. I do think I would have found the, the turn that it takes extremely creepy and frightening when I was actually a kid, so like, I'm not certain how I would feel about recommending this to actual young children. But anyways, I gave it three stars. There was still, there were still lots of things about it that I appreciated. Okay, the next thing I finished in the month of December was another, you know, full real novel. Hooray for me! Um, and that is The Forever War by Joe Haldeman. Um, this is a classic uh, anti-war military SF novel that uh, is inspired by the Vietnam War. It was published, I think, in the 1970s. Um, this was good in a lot of ways. It was really, really interesting. I found it very disturbing while reading it. I think I was supposed to, um, but I, as a, as a reader, am very um, prone to being disturbed by disturbing things I read. I think uh, in more personal ways than I'm supposed to. I actually kind of had to take a break in the middle of this book and step away and say, okay, I'm going to like wait a while, stop having nightmares, and then <laughs> come back and finish this later. So this was a hard book for me to get through. And I think that in some ways military SF might just not be my genre because I do have a really hard time reading about war. Um, you know, if it's dealt with in like an actual like atrocities of war type of way, which it probably should be. I'd also had this described to me as sort of like a, a counter argument to um, Starship Troopers, which I really disliked. I will link you the video where I talked in great detail about why I disliked Starship Troopers. Um, I won't go into that here. But it starts off with a very similar premise, which is where our um, our main character, William Mandela, is starting off in, like, a boot camp to go fight in the space war. And the premise of the space war is fairly similar in which humans encounter the aliens and inevitably, like, right away end up at war with the aliens. But from the very start in this book, it's pretty clear that this is an ill-advised war. Um, there's been no attempt at diplomacy whatsoever. We don't know anything about these aliens except we think think they attacked us, maybe? And so we must fight back. The main character in this has been drafted um, via a program where uh, people who are considered to be, you know, the cream of the crop intellectually are drafted to go fight in the war, but they end up being like cannon fodder, basically. Um, you know, the boot camp scenes are, are absolutely horrific. People die in training for absolutely no reason. This is all pretty much the same as Starship Troopers, except it's told from a much more skeptical viewpoint. But where this book really gets interesting is when they start actually going to fight the war. And because they're going to these places that are so far distant, um, time is passing much more quickly for them. So between every you know, time they engage with the enemy, like, centuries have passed back on Earth. So, of course, it's a nightmare technologically to try to strategize this war, um, but it also means that if you are so lucky as to survive a combat engagement or two, um, which not many people do, you end up sort of, by default, being like this super veteran, um, f this relic of centuries past. So over the course of this book, Mandela, you know, acquires this extreme amount of seniority while still being something of a skeptical newbie to this war, as the whole of human civilization is constantly changing around him and becoming more and more strange and alien. And that is what is really interesting in this book. I also personally find, like, displacement in time narratives deeply unsettling uh, for various reasons. It's part of why I'm a little averse to time travel. So I, f I found the whole book very unsettling. Let's get that over with. I thought that the main character in this was pretty uninteresting. I felt like the whole book I didn't really have any strong idea of him or why I should care about him. I think that's maybe part of it. 
um, this sort of idea that he is just this kind of random guy. I was actually way more interested and invested in the character of the woman that he ends up developing a long-term romantic relationship over the course of this book with. She's a little more of a conscientious objector type who gets labeled as a coward um, and isn't advanced through the ranks as much because of that, um, and I thought that I, I might have found the book a little more compelling if it was told from her point of view instead of his. This book also deals a lot with sexuality and changing ideas about sexuality over the centuries. Towards the beginning, actually, there were some scenes that I found really sort of disturbing with women in the military sort of being forced to have sex with the men. And then over the course of the book we see homosexuality become the norm in society and the main character dealing with his discomfort about that. So anyways, there are lots of really interesting things in this book. I personally didn't love it and it might just be because military SF isn't really for me. I gave it three stars. The next book I read was a predictable five-star read for me, though, and that is The Boy Who Lost Fairyland by Catherine M. Valenti, the fourth book in the Fairyland series. These have all been five-star reads for me um, because I just absolutely love this series so much. It's so wild and whimsical and imaginative. This is a sort of break from the main narrative of the story. Um, instead of following September, we follow this young troll named Hawthorne from Fairyland who is um, in a, an early chapter that's a very sort of clever inverse, uh, almost point for point of the first chapter of the first book, whisked away from Fairyland to become a changeling in Chicago where he becomes a boy named Thomas Rude. And right away this just like grabbed my heart because this is about a kid uh, who like doesn't understand why there isn't magic in this world, like why inanimate objects don't talk to him. Um, and he forgets that he was a troll, but he's still deeply displaced. And the way that he interacts with our world, the real world, is just so poignantly written, and I just loved it. He eventually makes friends at school with a girl named Tamberlane, who it turns out is also a changeling of sorts, and together they make their way back to Fairyland, where their storyline meets up with what's been happening with September. I loved it. I loved it. Five stars. And then, uh, while I was traveling for the holidays, I wasn't reading print books, I was reading on my Kindle, and what I was reading on my Kindle was River of Teeth by Sarah Gailey. This is a Tor.com novella. It's the first in, I believe, a duology. I don't think there are going to be any more of them. Um, that's an alt-history western about feral hippos in Louisiana. Well, it's about a crew of, like, hippo-riding cowboys, cowpersons, rather, um, of all genders, who end up uh, getting hired to eradicate a feral hippo problem in um, a particular location, the part of the Mississippi River that has been dammed and is turned into this hippo swamp. It's basically a character-driven caper with a lot of diversity. I will hopefully be reading the second book, Taste of Marrow, soon, and then I'll be able to do a full series review of this duology. I will say, about, like, the first half of the book as we were getting introduced to all of these characters, I, um, I thought this was gonna be, like, a five-star read for me, and then around the second half, the actual execution of the caper, or as Winslow Houndstooth, uh, insists it is an operation because they have been hired by the government, even if their methods are not, um, completely above board. But the actual execution of the caper was not as fulfilling to me as the introduction and establishment of the characters was. Um, so I gave this four stars. I'm looking forward to reading book two, so watch out for me to be talking about this book in more eloquent detail in the future. And then the last book I finished was one that I was reading throughout the month of December on my Kindle, um, but I now do have a print copy as of earlier this month, so uh, I can show you the print copy even though I haven't hauled it yet. It's the Olive Fairy book edited by Andrew Lang. Um, this is one of the later books in the series of colored fairy books from the 
late 19th, early 20th, sort of turn of the century. When was this one published? Yeah, so this one was published in 1907. I had never read any of the Colored Fairy books before. One of the fun things about starting late in the series is that the more popular tales that everyone knows are kind of in the earlier books, and then as you get later and later, they get more and more obscure. Um, so basically, I had never heard of any of these stories before. There's like one that's basically... Um, an uncredited ripoff of Thumbelina with a different name. But other than that, these were all 100% new to me. Um, these are collected from, um, I think, Turkey, India, Denmark, Armenia, Sudan, and France are, I think, where primarily the stories in this volume come from. I picked this one up because the Into the Forest Goodreads group that I'm a member of was reading one of the stories in this, and that is The Snake Prince. And I decided that I would just read the whole thing. So The Snake Prince is one of the shorter stories in this book. Um, it is a sort of Cupid and Psyche type story, the sort of search for the lost husband type, um, that I think is supposed to be from India. Um, it's not super clearly credited, but it's got those story elements. The princess breaks the taboo not to ask her husband about his magical birth. Um, he was transformed from a snake um, into the baby that the king and queen wanted. And so because she makes him tell her that where he came from, he turns back into a, state, into a snake and she has to win him back from the queen of the snakes. There aren't like super elaborate tasks, she just kind of has to confront the queen of the snakes. Um, but still, it has all of those sort of hallmarks of the Cupid and Psyche story. But there's just a wonderful variety of stories in this book. I don't even know if I can list like standouts. Um, the Blue Parrot is a standout for having like a major character who is the Swan Fairy, who's like the queen of this kingdom. I'm like, excuse me what does it even mean to be a swan fairy and how do I become one when I grow up? Basically the swan fairy has to like try to rescue the prince who's in love with her daughter who has been kidnapped by this sorcerer or something. As uh, was a long time ago since I read it. Eventually like the prince gets turned into a parrot and the princess gets turned into a tree and some elaborate things have to happen in order to turn them back into people. It's weird and cool. And this is what I love about original fairy tales, when they get, like, that wild. There are plenty of stories in this book um, with very proactive female protagonists, which is one of the things that, like, original fairy tales have a, a bad name for having only passive female characters, and that's just not true at all if you start reading a lot of them. Samba the Coward is one where um, the prince marries this princess, but he's a coward and he doesn't want to like go off and fight the war, so she dresses in his armor and goes and fights in the war for him until she tricks him into going out and leading his army. Dorani, I think, was the one that feels like a Twelve Dancing Princesses with only one princess, um, where like her husband turns invisible and like figures out that she's going to the fairy court at night, um, except that after he confronts her with it, she has to actually trick the fairy king into n not having her back um, so she can go be with her husband. There are a lot of them that fall under that sort of classic category of like, princes and princesses have trials and tribulations, but not all of them do at all. There's like the fate of the turtle, which is just like about a turtle and some ducks. I really liked The Boy Who Found Fear at Last. It's about this boy who like doesn't know what fear is and sets out to find it. Um, and there are a lot of a lot of things in that story that I really liked. I can't remember the title of the one, so I can't find it in here, but there's one story where like this woman adopts a young boy who turns out to be terrible and abusive of his wife when he grows up and so she like turns him into various animals because apparently she can do that and like sends him away as punishment every time after seven years he like comes back and turns into a human again and tries to beat his wife again she like turns him into a worse animal and sends him away. Um, there were some of them that were just 
just had utterly bizarre things, not totally in a great way. Uh, the story of Zulvisia was one where I read it and I'm like, what is even, what, ha why, what? I'm not even going to try to explain that one, I don't think I can. Um, the second to last story though, The Punishment of the Fairy Gangana was like super bizarre weird but in a way that I really actually did enjoy. It's incredibly elaborate and I'm not gonna try to explain the, the plot of it, but there's like the bad fairy Gangana who's like abducting princes and princesses and the good fairy is like the field fairy and they're like up against each other to try to, you know, achieve various ends with the human royalty. And they're like trying to out trick each other, they both go to the, the fairy queen for help, um, and it's it's all about this other royal family that's going on over here. But at a certain point, there's like all these random dragons, and we're like, whoa, dragons! And then the the good fairy, the field fairy, like gets on her flying lizard, and you're like, oh, this is not a dragon. If if this is not a dragon, then like, what are the dragons? And then Gangana like turns into an ostrich and flies away with some people on her back. And you're like, wait, you know the ostriches don't fly? Do you know that? Anyways, this is kind of what I like about fairy tales. You stumble on some really bizarre things. Anyways, I gave this four stars. I think if you are looking to pick up a book of like weird obscure fairy tales, this is a pretty good one. Um, anyhow, that is all I read in December. Uh, let me know if you are interested in any of these books, if you've read them, if you are planning to. Anyhow, I hope you have a very nice day. That is all. Bye for now.